And why don't you go ahead and grab a Bible and turn to Philippians chapter 4. We are in our last week of our Money Talks series. Um, when I was uh, a teenager in youth group, uh, I was one of those teens that just loved youth group, went every week, and I can remember in our youth room in the church that I grew up in, there was a poster, and this poster was of a, a basketball player like doing a slam dunk, right, Michael Jordan, or whatever, right? And then it said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I remember going, is this about basketball? Uh, and if you just Google, uh, I'll show you a few other ones. If you just Google, uh, you go back, go back, don't, you're going too fast. Uh, if you just Google Philippians 4.13, well, here's a guy rock climbing with no safety things. I can do it because Jesus strengthens me to climb this rock. I'm like, Maybe. Uh, you can go to the next one. There's uh, uh, another basketball one. Uh, he's going to make that basket, right? Because Christ strengthens him to play basketball. I'm like, really? You can go to the next one. Uh, there's a lot of rock climbing ones for some reason. Uh, but rock climbing, and I can do it because Jesus strengthens me. Oh, why don't we do one? I think there's one more. Um, so this is like weightlifting. I can lift this thousand pound weight because Jesus. So just if you can later, you can Google. There's all sorts of images like this. And maybe you have a coffee cup or a, a, a pillow with this stitched on it. But Philippians 4.13 is one of those verses that we use a lot, but we like misuse it. I'm not sure that like Paul is talking about rock climbing or shooting baskets. I can do it because Jesus gives me the strength to climb this mountain. I don't think that's what this means. But there's lots of verses, right, like that, that we just kind of, we pull out of the context. What if I told you that Philippians 4.13, the context is actually money? The context of that verse is Paul saying, I know how to be content with a lot or little. I can do all things through Christ who strength. Paul's talking about finances. He's talking about contentment. He's not talking about basketball, right? So that, that's the, the, the passage we want to study this morning. And really, the, how we're ending um, this whole series about money is asking the question, well, what does contentment look like? Like if someone came to you and said, hey, you can learn how to be completely satisfied in whatever financial circumstance you happen to be in, would you want to learn that? If someone said, hey, I have the secret to contentment, and, and whether you are rich or poor, whether you have a lot or a little, I can teach you how to be perfectly content and satisfied. That's our passage this morning. How do you learn the secret of contentment? So think about all the, the, that we've looked at and what the Bible says about money. If you could be content instead of chasing money or desiring riches or falling into the snare of the love of money or on the opposite of hating money, anxiety over how much I have and can I buy that? Is that too much? Should I give it away? Do I have too much? Or, 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 or um, beating yourselves up over your, the amount of money you have. What if you could just learn to just, uh, either, either scenario, I'm just content, I'm satisfied. Um, the book of Philippians, let me give you a little bit of background before we study. Really, we're going to be looking at the very end of the letter. But Paul is writing a letter to the church in Philippi, and really a large portion of it is he's thanking them, this church in Philippi, for a gift that they sent. Paul writes Philippians from prison, and you have to understand in that day and age, prison was not like prison in our day and age, uh, where prison is uh, uh, funded by the, the state, and we just pay, taxpayers pay, for prisoners to have three meals a day. They have, uh, you know, it's not nice, but they have a bed, they have a blanket, they have the facilities to use, and we pay for that, correct? But in that day and a prison was, we're going to just throw you in there, and you get literally nothing. What about my three meals a day? Tough! If you want food, 
Someone else has to provide the food for you. We're not giving you anything. So when Paul, when the church sends Paul a gift, most likely it was either uh, resources. Paul, we're going to send you food so that you can actually eat while you're rotting in prison. Or it was money and now people who lived near where Paul was in prison, now we can go and we can buy Paul a blanket. We can buy Paul some food for the day. We can buy him the, the necessities that he needs. That's how prison was in that day. So this church had sent a gift to Paul, and Paul is writing this letter to encourage them and to thank them for that gift. And he ends uh, Philippians in chapter 4 by thanking him for this gift, but then he kind of goes off on this little tangent, and he talks about, well, what what does contentment look like? And and he actually uses this kind of language. How do you learn the secret of contentment? What does that look like? So let me read Philippians 4, uh, verses 10 to 13, and then we'll just kind of walk through it uh, together. So you can follow along in your Bibles. It says this, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The word of the Lord. So you'll notice that Paul in verse 10, uh, he basically is telling this church in Philippi, uh, thanks for the gift, right? He's, he's actually glad. Paul says, I'm rejoicing in the Lord that you were able to do this, that you were able to uh, revive your concern for me. You sent this gift. I think Paul's rejoicing um, that they did that because what have we learned about generosity? When you're, you, when you're generous, God blesses you. So he's saying, hey, it's great. I'm rejoicing that you decided to be generous that you've, you, you're concerned about me in a prison cell and, and you didn't have an opportunity yet, but now you've given. And so I'm so thankful for that. But then look in verse 11, he clarifies. He goes, not that I'm speaking of actually being in need. So what he's saying is I'm not sitting in the cell going, Boo, poor Paul, right? I don't have anything. I wish I had food. He says, not that I'm whining, not that I'm complaining. He says, not that I'm actually in need. Like, he's in jail. He has nothing, right? And Paul goes, not that I'm actually in need. And why, Paul? He says, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. So Paul, what he's doing, Paul's thankful for the gift, but he wants to now teach this church in Philippi. But you have to understand, it's not like I was dependent on the gift. He's like, I'm good. Thank you for the gift, but in reality, I didn't actually need it. Why? Because he says, I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Here's the first thing that's really clear. Um, Even the Apostle Paul had to learn how to be content. What does that tell us? Um, Contentment is not a natural thing for us as humans. I think the fact that even the Apostle Paul says, I had to learn contentment means contentment does not come easily to us. It's something that you you have to learn, right? So if you're like, I struggle with contentment, I want to learn. Well, join Paul. Paul's like, I had to learn how to be content. Now, the question then is, well, what does Paul actually mean by the word content at the end of verse 11? What does that word actually mean? And here's what's super fascinating. In the Greek, literally, Paul says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be self-sufficient. So um, some of you who have, uh, some of you parents who have kids, you'll know that when uh, your kids are uh, babies, they are very reliant on you. Like if you have a newborn, literally, I mean, if you're a mother, like you literally feed your baby. Like they need you to live, to survive. You're up with them in the night. You change their diapers. Like if it wasn't for you, your babies would die. And they're so reliant on you. But as your kids get older, older, 
you'll see, oh, you're actually becoming a little bit more independent, a little bit more self-reliant. Like our kids are 10, 8, and 4, and so we're kind of moving into this, wow, this is really nice. None of them are in diapers. Praise God, I'm not spending $10,000 every month on diapers. And you're like, this is great. And I remember the day that our oldest was able to get up in the morning and like, I'm going to pour my own bowl of cereal and I don't have to wake you guys up. It's like, thank you, God. <laughs> right? And they start becoming more and more independent and self-reliant. And they can start doing things. And, and they can bathe themselves. And they, can learn, they, they know how to dress themselves. And you're like, wow. They're becoming self-sufficient. More self-reliant. Is that what Paul means here? That in order to be content, you just have to learn how to get by and rely on yourself. That's literally what the Greek word means. I've learned how to be self-sufficient. So you go, wait, wait, what, Paul, what are you saying? Are you saying that literally in order for me to be content, I just have to learn how to like pull myself up and dig deep down and find this contentment in myself? We, we should go, that can't be what Paul means. What Paul is doing is actually and we miss it in the English language, it's actually a play on words in the Greek language because there was a whole worldview in the first century called Stoic philosophy. And you can probably guess when you talk about, well, that man or that woman is very Stoic. What do you mean? They're just, you can't read them. Their they're face, like you can't tell. Are you happy? Are you sad? I can't tell. You're just very stoic. There was a whole worldview called stoic philosophy, and that is how they defined self-sufficiency and contentment. They said, contentment is a, is a reality located within yourself. And the idea was, in their pantheon of gods, right, whatever the gods should throw at you, Good or bad, you just have to remain stoic and not give them the satisfaction that their decisions are affecting you. Right? So the God of whatever throws disease your way or your, your crops die, just stay stoic. Don't give the gods the satisfaction. I am self-sufficient. That, that was the, the thinking of, of, of Paul's day and age. Contentment is just within myself. But you go, Paul, is, are you just affirming that? You can't be. Because everything else that you read in the, no, in the New Testament, we are never told, hey, the answer comes from within. That's actually the antithesis of the entire gospel. <laughs> is it not? The entire gospel is within. Don't look within because there's nothing good in there. You need help from an outside source. That's the gospel. You can't make it on your own. You need Jesus. And then everywhere else in the, God, in, in the New Testament, we're never told once, hey, just look within for the answer. Never. Now, unfortunately, this kind of self-help creeps into the church, and you hear that kind of teaching lots. Jesus just wants you to look for the treasure within you. Eh, that's not in the Bible. The, the Bible's message is, man, don't look to yourself, look to Jesus. So Paul can't be confirming, yes, Stoic philosophy, they're on to something here. Self-sufficiency uh, self and contentment is from within. I think what Paul is doing is he's using a word that they would all go, ah, okay, Paul is, Paul is playing on words here. He's, he's using the language of Stoic philosophy, but... He's not telling us, oh, I just have to look within. Why? Because verse 13 tells us, here's where you look. You want contentment? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul says the, the, the source of contentment is not looking within. It's looking without. It's looking to Jesus. He's the one who strengthens you. And this, the word strengthen means to fill with power, to make strong you could literally translate verse 13, I can be strong through the one who makes me strong. So where is the strength coming from? Don't look within. I can be content by looking to the one who makes me content. So I think Paul is pointing to the larger cultural belief of Stoic philosophy and saying, man, that's going to leave you empty. You're going you're gonna to come up short every time. You want to know how in every situation to be content and satisfied and have sufficiency in all things? 
Jesus is the one who's going to make you strong. So that's why Paul literally can say to the church, hey, thanks for the gift. Thanks for the basic necessities to live, but I actually don't need anything. Really, Paul? Rotting in a jail cell? I'm good. I'm content. And it's not just me being stoic and not telling you how I actually feel. Paul's saying, no, actually, deep down, Jesus is the one who gives me strength. I am completely satisfied. Then he goes on in verse 12. Paul is going to expand on what he means by when he says, in every situation I am in, I, I've learned how to be content. Verse 12, he says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. So do you notice that Paul's giving us two ex extreme opposites? He's like, I know how to be brought low, I know how to hunger, and I know what it means to be in need. That's someone at their lowest. And then he says, on the flip side, I know how to abound, I know how to have plenty, and I know what it looks like to have abundance. So right, he's giving two polar opposites. And Paul says, uh, in, in either extreme, I, I know how to be content. I know how to be satisfied. So then you, ha you have to ask, okay, do we actually have examples of Paul living through these extremes where he abounded and he had plenty, more than he could need, and when he is brought low and he's in, in need? I think most of us go, well, we know Paul was brought low. But what about seasons where, where Paul was, had more than he needed? Um, if, you, if you have a Bible and you want to flip there, Acts chapter 16 is a great example of Paul having uh, more than he could need. Acts 16, it'll be on the screen as well, verses 13 to 15. Um, it says this, this is uh, uh, Paul and, and it's describing some of the things that they were doing. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So here's why this is an example of Paul having more than he needs. Um, Lydia was a very, very wealthy woman. Um, how do we know that? Well, we're given a few clues in the text. She's from Thyatira, which was a very wealthy city, and she's a seller of purple goods. Do you know who were the only people in the first century who wore the color purple? Royalty. And you, you, you wouldn't just go to, you know, Michael's and say, I'm going to buy a roll of purple. You couldn't afford it. So people who could afford purple linens and purple goods and things like that were royalty. And she's the one that's selling it to all of these kings and queens and uh, all of these royal figures. Man, Lydia was rolling in it. She had money. And she believes the gospel. God opens her heart. She hears the gospel. She believes. She's baptized. And she tells Paul and his traveling companions, you have to come stay with me. And the, the wording, she prevailed upon us, it's, it's basically she would not accept no for an answer. And so we, we can, we can uh, properly guess that, well, Paul stayed with her. And if you stay at a, at a wealthy person's house, your needs are totally met. It's very different from a jail cell. You probably have a very comfortable mattress and you have uh, nice linens to sleep in and you have food to eat. And notice that Paul, Paul went. Now the very next passage, here's why the Bible is amazing. What happens in the very next story? Paul's in jail. Right? So I'm going from, Paul's going from staying at Lydia's house. She's wealthy, abundance, plenty. And then what happens? Then he's locked up in jail. The exact opposite. Need, want, suffering, and then when the Philippian jailer is converted, do you know what it says in verse 34? Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. Paul's got his needs met again. And then the very end of uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 40, after they leave 
uh, prison, it says they went out of the prison and they visited Lydia. So they stayed with Lydia again. So here's an example of Paul where uh, he has more than he needs. I had a roof over my head. I had uh, food in my belly. I had abundance. I had provision. I stayed with Lydia, the Philippian jailer. Let me stay with him. He fed me. Now if you go to 2 Corinthians 11, then you'll see the opposite extreme where Paul experienced the, the, the worst of the worst. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24, he says, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. Were you in danger, Paul? Yep. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night. Look, in hunger and thirst, often without food. In cold and exposure. Paul, have you experienced being brought low and hunger and need? Yeah, probably more than any of us in the room. But Paul, have you experienced abundance and plenty and abounding? Yeah, So when Paul says in in our passage in Philippians 4, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound, I know how to hunger, and I know to have more than I need. I mean, he's, he's not lying. Paul lived it. In his life, he experienced both extremes. And it's amazing to me that Paul says, in whatever situation I'm in, I know how to be content. He actually says, which is super interesting, uh, that he learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Do you want to, uh, uh, some of you tell me like, enough with the Greek, we get it. But it, Greek is amazing, okay? This is what it literally says in Greek. I have been initiated into the mysteries. And you go, that sounds mystical. <laughs> Do you know what Paul's doing? He's doing another play on words. Because another massive worldview of the day in the first century was Gnosticism. And if you were a Gnostic, you believed that there was hidden secret knowledge that was untapped. And if you just paid the right person or went to the right thing or unlocked within yourself, you could have access to this hidden, secret, mysterious knowledge. I I think Paul has a sense of humor, and he goes, guys, I was initiated into the mysteries. And everyone goes, ooh. Really, what he's doing is it's a play on words. He's not saying, by the way, all the Gnostics are right. There is secret, hidden knowledge. What does he mean when he says, I was initiated into the mysteries of these extreme opposites? You want to know what he means? He means the sovereign hand of God put Paul in situations where he abounded and where he was brought low. Where he was hungry and where he had plenty. Where he was needy and where he had abundance. He goes, I was initiated into this, guys. God put me in prison. Welcome to the initiation. God put me in Lydia's house. So he's like, I've learned all of this because it was the sovereign hand of the Lord who led every aspect of my life. He initiated me into learning the secret to contentment. I think Paul was confident that he was in the will of God in every and all situations. That's how he learned. He says, I I can do all things through Jesus who strengthens me. Because Jesus in his providence and in his sovereignty has put me in every situation so that I had to learn the secret to contentment. So here's what I'm going to do for you this morning. I'm going to tell you the secret for free. Okay, then buy my book for $19.99 and you'll learn more about this. No, I'm just kidding. But do you want to know what I I think when Paul says, okay, here's the secret to contentment? If you have a pen, you can write this down. Here is the secret to contentment when it comes to your finances. Do you trust God? And you're kind of like, 
oh, that's it? I think that's Paul's whole point. It is not some, ooh, secret, hidden knowledge. Do you trust God? In, what, in whatever situation you're in, good, bad, right? Plenty, not enough. Do you trust God? And here's why this is so key. Trusting God is really simple, but it is not easy. There's no like, here's 12 steps to trust God. Trusting God is really simple, but so many of us struggle with it because it's not easy. And I think the difficulty of trusting God goes all the way back to the garden, does it not? Because what, what caused the fall of mankind? It was a lack of trust in God, right? The serpent comes, God creates all of this beauty, this perfect creation, and Adam and Eve are placed in the garden, and God gives them one command. You can eat from all the trees, just don't eat from this one. And then what happens? Satan comes and he goes, did God really say you can't eat from any of the trees? Right? Like, that seems harsh. And the woman answers and says, well, no, God didn't say that. He said we just can't eat from the one in the middle of the garden and we're not allowed to touch it or we die. Is that what God said? Nope. So what is that? The woman is buying into the lie. Can we trust God? And what does the serpent say? Oh, that's not the truth. God knows that when you, he's holding out on you. Can you actually trust a God like that? He knows that if you eat, you'll become like him. That's why he doesn't want you to eat. He doesn't have your best interests in mind. And so what happens? Adam and Eve believe the lie. Listen, I'm convinced that all sin, all sin begins with a fundamental, you're, you're believing a lie about God and then you choose to act out in sin. If, you, if we just believed the truth about God, we wouldn't fall into all of these pitfalls, I think. But it, it, it always starts with, God's holding out on me. God said that. He's not a good God. He's, he's trying to ruin my life. And then we go and we act out in sin. Do we not? It is so hard to trust God because of the fall. We bought the lie. And so I think because of the fall, naturally, left to ourselves, human beings do not trust God. We believe lies about him. But the secret to learning contentment is that when you go through these different situations and seasons of life, when you go through a season of life where you have plenty and abundance, and then when you go through a season of life when you have hunger and need and not, a lot, not enough, the secret to contentment is learning to trust in the sovereign hand of God in all things. To say, I, I might not understand why I'm going through these different seasons. But I know what the, the, the answer isn't. I know that it can't be because God doesn't love me. I know it can't be because God's not in control. Because I, I know that to be true. I know that God is providentially, his hand is on my life. And whatever situation I, I'm in, I know that I have been put there by the sovereign Lord Jesus. I can trust him. So here's some practical things to just remind yourself. When you go through a season, let's say, in your life of abounding and abundance and plenty, here's a few things that you should do. Because if you don't, this is what will happen, inevitably, with both extremes. If you go through a time of your life where you're abounding and you have plenty and you have more than you need, if you don't trust the sovereignty of God, you will begin to take credit for all of it. You will go, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an amazing businessman. I'm so smart. I'm making so much money. I have so much because look at how great I am. And then the opposite is true. When you go through a time in life when you don't have enough and, and, and the cupboards are bare and you don't have money in the bank, you will fall into despair because you will think this is somehow my fault and, and God's not there. But if you actually believe, this is why the, the doctrine of God's providence and his control over everything is so vital because then you won't fall into pride and arrogance or despair. You will learn contentment. So when you go through a, a time in your life of abounding and abundance and plenty, remind yourself of these things. Admit that you don't deserve the abundance. And realize that it is all God's grace. 
give thanks for the abundance. Right? Like enjoy it from a gi- as a gift from God. But in, in the midst of the abundance, and this one's hard, in the midst of abundance, remember the all-satisfying value of Jesus. Right? Jesus is, Jesus is better than, than all of this abundance that I have. And then acknowledge that God could take it all away in a moment. Right? So when you look at your life and your cupboards are full, you have, you have more than enough, the, the gas tank in your car is full, you have money in the bank, your RSP is doing great, whatever. You, you have to remind yourself of these things. Right? This is all a gracious gift from God. Jesus is, Jesus is so much better than all of this. And in a moment, God could take it all away. Now, on the flip side, when you go through uh, a time of being brought low or uh, experiencing hunger and need, remind yourself a few things. Acknowledge that even that is from God's loving hand. I mean, that's really easy to say. But when you go through need and want, when Paul is thrown into jail and he goes, this is God initiating me into the mysteries of contentment. So when you go through want and need and hunger, you go, God, even this is from your loving hand. Remember that God promises to turn all things for our good. That doesn't necessarily answer, okay, why specifically am I going through this thing? But you go, right, God promises that all things work together for the good of those who love him. In some grand way that I don't understand, God is going to use all of these things, all of the want and the need and the hunger, he's going to use it for my good. And then remind yourself that Jesus is more to be desired than all the things of the world. Do you remember that? Him, take the world, but just give me Jesus. Right? When the cupboards are bare and there's no gas in the car and your bank account is empty, you still get the king of glory. You go, man, that's way better than any amount of money. You have to remind yourself. You have to say, right, Jesus is better than that, than, the, than what the world offers. Um, if you know the book of Job, this is exactly what Job's attitude was. Job was a very wealthy man, and he had a lot. He had cattle, and he had beautiful children that loved him, and he had uh, so much. And in an instant, God allowed all of it to be taken away. His kids died. His uh, All of his cattle was stolen. And Job, uh, the initial time, responds by saying, okay, well, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then there's round two, right? And what happens? Well, Job is hit with sickness and boils, and he's just kind of in this miserable state. And in chapter two of Job, his wife comes. <laughs> his wife is lovely. His wife says, curse God and die, Job. Are you still going to try and be someone with integrity? And Job's answer is, you're foolish. The way you're talking is foolish. Shall we receive good from God, but not also disaster? Am I only going to worship God when everything in my life is going great? He says, foolishness. Now, you have to understand, Job didn't just then go and, like, I'm going to sing a a worship song now, and I'm not going to pretend that my life sucks. The whole book of Job is him wrestling, going, why is this happening? And he's miserable, and he's suffering, and his three friends come, and they give him terrible advice. But throughout the whole thing, it says Job doesn't sin. He doesn't curse God. He doesn't blame God. God eventually shows up, and and you know what God's answer to Job is? Why did you do this to me? God's answer is, who are you to question me? And Job's answer is not, well, that doesn't seem fair. Job's answer is, you're right. I am a foolish man. And he just accepts the sovereign hand of God. Listen, so much of what we've talked about through our money series directly relates to do, do we trust God? Like, do you remember all the way back in week one, Jesus told his disciples, don't be anxious about what you're going to eat or drink. Well, why, Jesus? Why shouldn't I be anxious? Anxious, He says, your, your father knows that you need those things. So trust him. 
So do you trust in the sovereignty and providence of God? He will look after you. Um, most of us in North America haven't really, I mean, th- to varying degrees, we've struggled with being brought low and hunger and need, but m- most of us, I mean, we don't face the same kind of hunger and need as other parts of the world because we've been just very blessed in North America. But I, I can remember seasons in my life growing up where, uh, looking back now, I understand what my parents were going through. As a kid, you're like, I don't understand. There were years where my parents couldn't afford a Christmas tree, and so my mom would use whatever kind of paints that she had, and she would paint a Christmas tree on the wall, and it would be like, yay, imagination Christmas this year, because we just just did not have anything. And looking back, I'm like, oh, it's because my parents were broke. In the midst of it, it's like, well, that's kind of a fun spin on a Christmas tree. And my parents are like, we're just trying to get by and provide our kids with good memories. And there was years where there were no presents. And there were years when birthdays were like, well, uh, sorry, like here's a bowl of ice cream. We, there's a picture of me and there's a bowl of uh, a scoop of ice cream with a candle in it. And I look miserable. And it's like, happy birthday, Andrew. And as a kid, I'm like, this is my parents hate me. Looking back, I'm like, my parents had nothing. And then there's seasons where, yeah, you know what? We went on a trip as a family to Florida, and I told you about that one. (laughs) And uh, we we went and did things because then there were seasons of, oh, wow, we have more than we we need. And I know that you all have examples like that where it was like, I don't know how we're going to get by. I don't know how we're going to pay the bills. And then you have seasons where you're like, we have more than enough. But in all of those situations, the secret to just being satisfied is do you trust God? Um, Hebrews 3 is a great passage. It says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. And here's why. Why? Why should I be content with what I have? Because he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Why should I be content with not having enough material things? Because the Lord of the universe will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You can be content. And and then he says, so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? But what if if I go bankrupt and what if I can't pay my bills and what if I lose everything? Listen, you will never lose him. So be content. Be content. But what if I have more than I need and I make millions of dollars? Well, you know what? Still, the reality of never being forsaken by the Lord Jesus, that outweighs anything that you own. (laughs) Uh, I want to end by uh, reading an old poem from uh, William Cowper uh, from 1773. And, and what he did was he, he wrote this, uh, the, it's, they, they turned it into a hymn, but he wrote this old po- poem describing how do we trust God? How do we trust God's providential hand in our lives? Is God really in control? Is he orchestrating all things? How can I learn to trust him? And this, it's just so powerful. This is, what he, this is what he says. God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never-failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. I think what William Cowper is saying is so often we look at the, un, the unsatisfying things in our life and the hard times and the want and the need 
and we just shake our fists at God going, God, how can you be a good God and allow these things to happen? And when he says behind a frowning providence, because a lot of times we look at the providence of God. If God's really in control, he wouldn't do this to me. So you might see a frowning providence, but behind it is a loving, smiling God who knows that he is working out all things for his glory and for your good. So you can trust him. So take fresh courage. My my goal in this whole series has been that as followers of Jesus, we would just learn to trust God in the plenty and in the want that again, like we, we've said it often, that we would just live with this kind of open-handed gladness and contentment. Wouldn't, wouldn't, don't you want to be that type of person <laughs> that just is unfazed by the things of this world that you go, man, when I, have a, when I have more than I need, praise God. How can I give it away? When I have less than I need, you know what? Praise God because I trust him. He will take care of me. So, Father, I just thank you again for your word and what an encouragement it is to us. Um, God, I'm just encouraged that even the Apostle Paul had to learn how to be content. And he learned it, God, by you graciously putting him in both extreme situations. God, your sovereign hand put him in Lydia's house where he had more than he could need. And your sovereign hand put him in jail where he had nothing. And so truly, Paul was initiated into that secret by your loving hand. And so God, I, I know I can speak for myself. I want to be someone who is content. That isn't tossed to and fro by the things of this world And isn't tossed to and fro by my bank statement. I just want to learn how to be content in whatever situations you graciously put me in. And and I think that's probably the majority of the people in this room. We want that. I just want to be satisfied. I want to be content with what I have. So God, I pray in this, this might be a dangerous prayer to pray, but I pray that you would initiate us into those things. That God, when we go through seasons where you pour out your abundance on us and we don't have any needs, that we would learn to trust you even in that, that you are the one who graciously gives us all things. And then in the seasons of life where we don't have enough and we're struggling and we have need, that we would trust that even in those situations, you are enough, Jesus. So teach us how to be content, God. I pray that in all things we would just Hold our money and possessions with with open-handed gladness. Just do that work in our hearts, Jesus, we pray. And we pray this in your mighty name. Amen.